Welcome to the Metaphysical Martini Show, where wit and wisdom come together to bridge the gap between the spirit realm and the physical world. With Ani Abadisian, the Suburban Shaman, a production of Cosmic Reality Radio. Hello everyone, it's Ani Abadisian. Welcome to Metaphysical Martini. Three parts spirit, one part rational mind, two drops of optimism. Give it all a good hard shake and pour. Dress it with the olives of grace and empathy. Sip slowly and contemplate the wonder of cosmic creation. Mm. I'm having one now and woohoo, that's good stuff. I am very happy to be with you all on my first solo show with Cosmic Reality Radio. Some of you might have heard me chatting with Nancy and Dolly on the second Saturday of each month on the Say What show. But since this is my first solo flight, here's a little background. I'm a shaman, which is essentially a spiritual counsellor with an intuitive skill set. I call myself the suburban shaman because guess what? I live in the suburbs. In another era, I will be roaming the mountains and valleys of Transcaucasia, acting as the wisdom keeper and storyteller of my tribe, dispensing homemade medicine, mediating disputes, and doing whatever else the impartial wise woman or wise man of the village does, essentially bridging the gap between the spirit realm and the physical world. And it all sounds very lovely and idyllic, but change, my darlings, is a constant. Wars are fought. Genocides are perpetrated. Populations become displaced and borders change. People migrate. And to the victor go the spoils. And the victors embark on their relentless campaigns of resource gathering and power grabbing. Oh, we've seen this scenario play out time and time again throughout history. It's all part of that long-term agenda to eventually form a new world order. One where ethnic division is blurred, then written out of history altogether, and the planet is run as a company by the corporate controllers. But we'll talk more about that another time, because that's a very important subject, and a lot of you aren't aware of that. But meanwhile, back to me. So, to finish my background story, although my race ancestry is, uh, well, actually, it's Armenian, believe it or not, um, I'm sure with a good sprinkling of crusader blood, I've only ever visited Armenia as a tourist. I'm actually a Brit, a proud London girl, now living and working in the arboreal paradise that is the Pacific Northwest. Governments can change, and they do. Borders can be redrawn, and they are. History can be rewritten, and often it is. But those born into a shaman bloodline, we carry the ancient codes in our blood, in our essence in our coding, and we are honour-bound to serve wherever we may find ourselves, be it in the mystical Ararat Valley or in the checkout line of our local Safeway. Nowadays, you wouldn't come to me for herbal concoctions or to have your evil spirits removed, but you would call on me for good old-fashioned energy work, for property clearings, for spiritual counselling, and to take advantage of the many, many classes that I offer. And they're all excellent and wonderful, and they're all offered at many different levels. Uh, you know, we try to keep this light, because metaphysics, spirituality, today's world, man, it's crazy and it's heavy. So we inject as much humour into our counselling and our classes uh, as we can, because without humour, man, we might as well all jump off a bridge, really. Anyway, my bricks and mortar office is located just south of Portland, Oregon. But thanks to the magic of Skype, I can be all over the world without having to actually bilocate. And how handy is that? And to complement my time with Cosmic Reality Radio, I have my own YouTube channel. Just pop my name in the YouTube search bar and you'll find a great many short videos on various topics, all associated with spirituality, metaphysics and general awareness. If you enjoy those, I'd really appreciate it if you liked, shared and subscribed. And if I say so myself, and I do, they really are rather good. 
So, I hear you asking, what is Metaphysical Martini all about? Well, the broad theme is, let the spirit inhabit the human. In other words, if we reclaim our minds from the engineers of our perception, we will rediscover our true nature, because at our core, we are pure, unblemished cosmic intelligence, having temporary individualized manifestations as humans. And from that vantage point, we can change our world to reflect our spiritual heritage. It sounds simple, doesn't it? And at its core, it is. All big picture stuff is simple. But we have seven and a half billion culturally and socially indoctrinated people on the planet. If you take some time to observe humanity, really observe, and without judgment, not easy, the people around you, it's quite an eye-opener. There's an exercise I engage in from time to time with some of my more advanced mentorship students. We'll go to a predetermined location and having cleared and illuminated our light bodies, we just quietly observe people going about their business, you know. After a while, we start to see beyond the human form. People morph into strange and interesting shapes. Some change into slightly deranged robot chickens, clucking their way through the day from coffee machine to photocopy machine and back, moving in ways that make them seem productive, yet behind the eyes you can sense deep insecurity and a longing for something really meaningful to do. Others, well, they morph into giant walrus-like beings, Oversized bodies all splayed out, filled with so much pain, so much grief and disappointment and bitterness. And no matter how much they consume, nothing will ever again taste good enough to satisfy the deep void they feel inside. And visiting some of the big lot stores, won't mention any names, don't want to get into trouble, but it can be a real exercise in surrealism. I mean, we see family your family units walking up and down the aisles, carts piled high with various box goods, walking slowly, plodding, deliberately, almost as if they're in a trance. They turn the corner out of view, and when they come back into view, they've morphed into pale-skinned zombies, eyes vacant, staring at nothing in particular, unconsciously taking sips from their big gulps, grabbing items off shelves and placing them in the cart. Well, those are just three examples. And, you know, once in a while, I must be honest, and it's a lovely thing to see, we do see someone transform into something radiant and wonderful. And occasionally we see ooh, what we think might be angels. They don't really exist, but you know what I mean. You know, high hierarchy of light beings. But that's rare. We see enlightened people, aware people, but those that can maintain that, you know, those that are in the spiritual alignment and remain there consistently, that's such a rare thing to see. Important to remember, of course, these morphing forms don't represent our true form. They represent our current level of awareness, and that's based on our understanding of concepts such as unconditional love and the meaning of equality, both concepts which are misunderstood in spades on this planet. Got to ask ourselves, you know, how did we come to this? In an ever-expanding universe filled with wonders, ever-morphing, ever-changing, ever-growing, how did we become so sad and so small and angry and insecure and filled with self-loathing and nasty cheap food? How did we become so separate from the supreme cosmic intelligence that we know as source energy? Well, if we're going to take a stab at answering that, we need to clarify, I think, how we started out in the beginning of time and then try to make sense of who or what we are. I'm not sure that I can do that, to be honest, but here's a little story. It's an ancient shaman story 
And this is an abbreviated version of it. And it describes the creation of the world in a very ancient and romantic version of events. So if you're expecting a PhD scientific dissertation from me, you are going to be very disappointed. I'll, I'd rather have a little bit of this romance. So here he goes, okay? In the beginning, if there ever was such a time, there was source energy, pure, untried, unblemished cosmic energy existing in non-physical potential. That's us, by the way, pre-embodiment existing as potential. At some point, potential needs to express itself, to step outside non-being and go on an adventure to see what it's capable of. So that's exactly what happened. Source expanded. Some would say exploded and sent parts of itself outside itself to create and to explore. And that first manifestation of source outside itself was the realm of what we would come to know as archangels, primary expressions of source, the vanguard of new creation. And, you know, that's us, <laughs> pre-embodiment. Can you imagine how we must have felt? One moment we're pure, just pure potential, source energy, islands of paradise. The next minute, our sort of higher self throws us out the door and says, go explore. And we say, what? Explore what? Well, we don't, there's nothing. What? And so your higher self says, make something up. You're divine. You're cosmic. Go on a cosmic space adventure. Go. And that's exactly what happened. So, hey, these new archangels, I guess they figured it out because we're all here. And back to the story. <laughs> they co-created as one with Source, also known as Creator, reporting their activities and keeping Source in the loop at all times. In time, this realm of uh, archangels, primary expression, wanted to engage in further exploration. So, from their own essence, and always in full cooperation with Source, they created another realm of beings, beings we would come to know as angels. And the realms of angels and archangels explored together, always in full cooperation with Source. Every so often, when they wanted to take their explorations further afield, the newest realm of angels would create, from their essence, another realm of angels. And so it went, until one day. One day something quite amazing happened. Now, remember, all this exploring was done in thought form only. At this point, nothing physical exists. One day, the newest realm of angels, the ones farthest out, hit their heads on something. This confused them, because no thing existed. But, after much discussion with all other realms of angels and with Source, they came to the conclusion that they had hit their heads on their own thought forms. Wow. In other words, their thoughts had created a new level of experience, a new level of existence, a realm where one could live in spirit form or in physical form. As we can imagine, there was great excitement throughout the realms. Whoopee, said the angels. Whoopee, said the archangels. Oh, big whoopee, 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 whoop, 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 said Source Energy. But what shall we do with all this new material? I mean, how do we interact with it? We don't know what things are. Does anyone know how to make things? What are things? Can we really make things out of our thoughts? Did this really happen? What's going on? Oh my God, this is so exciting. And thus began a long period of experimentation. And with experimentation comes chaos. Ooh, who doesn't love a bit of chaos? Planets smashing into each other. Bam! Space debris flying all over the place. And the realization that these new physical constructs, far away from the heart of Source, had very short lifespans. They needed the Creator's warmth. They needed the Creator's love. And so the very first sun was created. And after that, everything pretty much fell into place and into orbit. Not saying there wasn't any chaos after that but it was more organized chaos. 
Valiant souls from the various angel realms volunteered to inhabit the planets, giving them life and the ability to sustain life upon them. This was wonderful. The soul inside the planet, the sun up there, the orbits happening. The first universe was formed. And it was decided that it needed a sort of a boss, a commander of chief, you know, to govern on behalf of source. So we call that a god. Every universe has one. So this god, well, who's it going to be? Well, Source decided that the god should be selected from the newest realm of angels, the ones where the ability to live in both physical and spirit form was first discovered. And it was done, and it was good. Once the first universe... Uh, did I say universe? I'm not going to cut and paste this. It's actually a universe and you know that. So whilst the first universe had maintained order for some time and experiments with various life forms were going well, the universal God, in full cooperation with all realms of source, decided that it was time for a higher level of sentient life to be created and started work on the first human forms. As with all new creations, the experimentation process was long and at times frustrating, but eventually a pleasing and functional form was found for both a female and a male. A great many sets of forms were put into production and when they were ready, brave souls stepped into the forms and prepared to project themselves onto the chosen planet to start life as humans. The first, very, very first humans. And that's us, by the way, pre-embodiment. We were there too. Parts of us were. How exciting. The very first human life. Some would call that, I think Matthew, the great Matthew soul, who writes uh, the messages from Matthew, described the humans as higher universal mankind. The very first time we would step on to a physical planet as physical beings. Clearly, this was a very important and pivotal event, and so the Universal God decided that the couples should practice in a visualization chamber, what we would call, I suppose, a hologram, before stepping foot on the planet. And that's sensible, you know, first time out and all that. Well, this they did. They went into the visualization chamber and they did the hologram thing, but, you know, the waves of excitement generated by the thought of having the first ever physical incarnation swept them right out of the visualization chamber and on to the planet. Oh my God, said God. Seriously, you guys, you weren't ready. Sorry, God, replied the root souls, but we're here now. And uh, may we say looking very splendid as bits of God's in bods. So we might as well get on with it and get on with it. They did. And here we are, billions of years' worth of experience later, multiple universes, 30 billion planets in this universe alone, still getting on with it, descended from gods, but living in a society with no concept of the true meaning of deity. Well, that's a lovely romantic story of the creation of the cosmos and of our spiritual heritage. In fact, it's so lovely, I'm going to take another sip of my martini. Hold on there, I'll, I won't be long. Oh my gosh, that is so good. One more, if you don't mind. Mmm, lovely. So there we are. We're trying to explain now how we got from there to hear. Because how does this lovely story help us to negotiate today's discordant world? And you know, despite our romantic origins, it doesn't explain who we are now. And there's a million and one different ways of explaining that, from the scientific to the super spiritual and everything in between. And I'll try and go somewhere in the middle, because that's generally where I like to be. Each of us has a soul, the vital spark of life from source. And the soul loves traveling, loves exploring, co-creating, and generally having a good time because we are manifestations of creator, which means that we were created to create. From time to time, our souls want a real challenge and they choose to have a physical incarnation on a physical planet. 
And that's when things get interesting, don't they? Because the bloodlines we choose to be born into have millions of years worth of DNA coding. And that coding is a filter which can compromise our cosmic intelligence. Our entire cosmic experience is now channeled through our tiny little human bodies and the millions of lines of code and the coded information running through it. So, you know, your soul is magnificent and wonderful, but, you know, you're born into a certain bloodline and all of the challenges are the codes that are written there. And it's not just medical information like, a, you know, okay, you're predisposed to gallbladder or alcoholism. There's all sorts of historical reference and perceptual engineering written in there. So there's the challenge. You know, anyone has a physical incarnation. We are brave souls, especially on this planet, because this planet is messed up seriously. Okay, back to the scientific stuff, kind of, sort of. So in addition to these DNA RNA codes, through our chakra system, we have access to every life experience we have ever had. And of course, through that same system, access to unlimited cosmic intelligence. Because the cosmos to me, a shaman, is just a series of vortexes and chakras all communicating information, talking to each other. You know, all points in time and space are the same and all that. Okay, so if that wasn't enough, we also have to negotiate our local world, our family, our tribe, the country we live in, planetary issues, everyone else's thought forms, pollution, fake news, mass indoctrination, and the list goes on and on and on. So yes, my darlings, we are confused and we are conflicted because it's busy in here. So much energy and information coursing through our physical and etheric bodies. It's a wonder we're not all locked up in the asylums for the insane, or maybe we are. So many times people tell us Earth probably is an insane asylum. Anyway, wherever we are, let's give ourselves a break and let's pat ourselves on the back for making it this far. Maintaining spiritual center in a world gone mad is no small feat. There's a popular saying going around right now, what doesn't kill you gives you dark thoughts and unhealthy coping mechanisms. Hmm, that's where most of us are today. But here's the thing. Remember the story earlier in the program about the root souls and the hologram? It never stopped being a hologram. All points in space and time are the same. Ego, time is merely a sense of chronology we have created as a convenience primarily for physical realms. And as for space, if everything occurs simultaneously in the same location, how can there be multiple universes taking up the same space? Oh, perhaps it all takes place in our heads. Perhaps. All space is the space in our heads. And perhaps perception is a tricky little devil. This is the sort of thing I want to discuss on this show. You know, how to keep the big picture stuff on your mainframe and how to use it to travel through time and enrich our human experience for the highest good, for the betterment of mankind, and ultimately for the glory and benefit of whatever you want to call supreme cosmic intelligence. All right. Well, let's see what we're going to do now. What is on my little piece of paper right now? It says it's time for question and answer. And of course, time for a very quick sip of my metaphysical martini. Lovely. Okay, question and answer time. You know, I love receiving your emails for many reasons. The main reason is it's good to know that someone actually listens to the shows and watches the videos. Sometimes you're just out there in the ether hoping that someone, someone's paying attention to you. The other reason I look forward to receiving them is that it gives me an idea of what peeps are thinking. And I must say, I have been encouraged by the elevation in general awareness of late. So keep them coming, my darlings. Keep developing your critical thinking skills and keep questioning everything. 
So our first question, oh, by the way, I should mention this. Um, if you want to give your full name and all that, you certainly can, but apparently most people don't. So initials are good and blah, blah, blah. And if you're going to use a pseudonym, just don't make it a stupid one because I throw those out. Thank you. Okay. Our first question is from Rachel W. in Manchester, UK. Hello, Rachel. Nice to hear from you, especially since I am a lifelong Manchester United supporter. Go Red Devils. And Rachel asks, everyone keeps talking about dimensional shift, but I'm not sure anyone understands it. Can you define dimensions for us in layman's terms, please? Well, in layman's terms is probably the only way I can define it for you, Rachel. So here's a stab. The easiest way, I think, to define dimensions is to see them as levels of awareness. The lower dimension, or the lower the dimension, the greater the sense of separation from source, the result of which is discord, extremes in contrast, polarity, war, hatred, uh, the refusal to entertain another person's point of view, and so forth. The higher the dimension, the closer we are to source, which results in a greater sense of unity through unconditional love and the understanding that we are all equal. The collective vibration of the population on planet Earth is still pretty much third dimensional, but that doesn't mean that higher levels of awareness don't exist alongside it. I mean, the fourth dimension is lapping at our shores. We just need to decide that it's, you know, safe to swim together. So what it really boils down to is this, for the whole dimensional thing. The more love you hold in your heart, the more you understand or try to understand unconditional love. And that's the vibration of cosmic creation. It's not the downgraded dysfunctional emotion that humans call love. The more love you hold in your heart, the higher your frequency will be. The higher your frequency means access to higher levels of cosmic intelligence and a better understanding of what harmonious co-creation is all about. So thank you for your question, Rachel. I hope that helped. You know, we you hear these concepts, you know, all points in time and space are the same. It's, it's, it's mind-blowing. I mean, maybe a quantum physicist can explain it to you, but actually, in my experience, no one's more excited about physics and quantum physics than all these newly minted PhDs in the subject, the cosmologists. They're in love with the cosmos. I think that's a beautiful thing. They talk their scientific talk as if they're writing a love letter to God. And I think we could all have a lesson from them, really. They're in love with creation again, without all of the 1-800 dial the prophet of my people, my way is the only way, without any of that scenario. They're just part of the glory of the divine cosmos, and that's good enough for them. And they try to make sense of it. They try to explain it. They try to put language to it. But in the end, it all boils down to the X factor, doesn't it? You sit back and you go, bloody hell, this is marvelous. How does anyone explain the glory of cosmic creation? Anyway, I digress. I do that from time to time, but you know what you're going to do. I'm, uh, you know, an old gal these days. There's no shutting me up when I'm when I'm on a roll. All right. Um, I have one more question here from someone. Oh, I'm not going to read that one. That's a very silly question. We may get back to Q&A in a bit. Um, but right now, perhaps we can lighten up for a little bit. You know, we'll lighten up. And I think it's time for a pat of poetry. You know, after a hard day's work, I like to come home and I like to enjoy a cup of tea or, a, you know, a small drinky poo, put my feet up and write a variety of poems. Some of them are silly, some of them are sassy, and some are just terrible. But, you know, who cares? I won't be submitting them for any poetry awards anytime soon. So here goes. So this one is called The Spoon, and it speaks to people who have limited social awareness, the people who believe everything they read in the papers and see on the televised news. The Spoon by Arnie Abedissian from really bad but occasionally brilliant poetry from a mad suburban shaman. The spoon that feeds you grows bigger each day. You don't ask what they're feeding, 
you just chomp away. Why bother thinking when you can dance to their tune? It's all prepped and ready. How opportune. But the problem with that is that your mind is entombed and all you have learned is the shape of the spoon. Hmm. I hope you enjoyed that because if you didn't, it was a very boring 60 seconds for you, wasn't it? Um, if you like that sort of thing, you know, really bad poetry, uh, I have a YouTube channel um, that, that is just a poetry channel and we've got all that sort of stuff on there as well. So check it out, why don't you? And if you like it and do subscribe things, well, thank you, thank you. And if you don't, well, fooey on you, we shan't hold it against you. All right. So we're going to do another little section right now. And you probably figured out by now on my first podcast that uh, I'm not really accustomed to this sort of thing. I, I do little videos. So uh, trying to watch the time and try to make everything happen together. Um, hopefully you'll see a great deal of improvement on my second one. But meanwhile, on to the next section. And this section I like to call the Wizard's Gizzard. Yep, a little magic to spice up the mundane. You know, we humans, we do love rituals. Once we've set an intention in thought form, the ritual grounds our intent. You know, think about it. If you go around just, you know, saging your house willy-nilly, nothing's going to happen. It's just going to smell of sage. But if you have an intention behind it, there's something magical about doing a physical ritual alongside it. So the most common example, I think... um. Yeah, it would be sort of lighting a white candle and burning incense during prayer or, you know, or sage. You know, the candle turns on our heart light and it illuminates the soul. And we pray by sending our thoughts into the ether, certainly. But when we burn incense, we can actually feel our words floating up to God in the smoke. And the lingering aroma of that good incense not only reminds us that our prayers have been heard, it acts as a spiritual fumigant, creating a space in which, uh, you know, the divine can be reached and its response transmitted. And it's always, always, always transmitted. God, or whatever you want to call God, always hears and always responds. Whether we choose to hear it, well, that's another matter altogether. Now, what type of incense to use is a matter of personal preference, but I really advise staying away from anything synthetic. Stick incense is convenient, it's easy to use and relatively inexpensive, but for the real deal experience, I recommend doing it the old fashioned way, which is to burn natural aromatic resins on small charcoal tablets, just as they do in traditional places of worship. One of my favorites is uh, three parts frankincense to one part myrrh. It's a very popular choice, and I call that a myrrh teeny. Ha -ha. Um, but top grade frankincense these days can be very pricey, probably something to do with Somali pirates or whatever. Um, so I only use the good frankincense for high ceremony. My go-to incense these days is a mixture of white gold and black copal with just a hint of benzoin. It's very fragrant. It has a very good, very high vibration, and it's really easy on the wallet. Of course, you can also smudge an area using bundles of sage and other aromatic grasses. Don't be afraid to experiment. But be warned, however, that, you know, that sort of stuff gives off a lot of smoke. So use caution when you're using it indoors. If you want a high vibration but less smoke, you can burn small sticks of what's called Palo Santo, Palo Santo Holy Wood, it's uh, from South America, Central America, and South America. It smells like a sweet campfire. But because it's a stick, not a grass, it's easier to use and it snuffs out easily. I always keep a stick in my handbag, by the way, because, and I'm serious about this, you never know when you'll be called upon for a quickie blessing. So, I'm going to have a sip of my martini. Mm. This is a very large martini, by the way, because you're only allowed one. <laughs> so... To, to recap on all of this, light your candle and touch your heart chakra. This affirms that you're ready to engage in whatever term you use for prayer or meditation. Purify the space with your chosen aromatic product and share your breath with the divine. 
as the smoke cleanses and removes all the redundant energies, it'll take your prayers to heaven. And as you sit quietly in prayerful contemplation, the smoke will carry divine inspiration back to you. And when your prayer time or your meditation time is over, snuff out the candle and make sure your incense is safely contained. Give thanks and get up and get on with our day. We all of us live unnecessarily busy lives. Taking regular time out for divine connection restores our sanity and forming a ritual around it adds potency to the energy so that's our tip from the wizard's gizzard this week i'll try and bring you one for every podcast i'm a big believer in ritual not that it makes a thing holy in itself but the you know if you think about it going back into caves of you know stone age man they learnt how to paint. They learnt how to draw what they thought was the representation of, uh, of higher beings. And we found altars in these caves. Altars where they burn wood, grass, bits of stuff. Because clearly they didn't go down to the local metaphysical shop and you know, buy incense. Why did they do that? I mean, yes, fire is holy. When they discovered fire, it cooks food, it keeps you warm. But there's something very sacred in ritual about the transmutation of a substance into smoke. It's the gap, isn't it, between heaven and earth, between the physical realm and the spirit realm. You have a solid substance and you burn it and it turns into ether, it turns into smoke and it gives off various different types of, uh, of fragrance, each one evoking different emotions. And the substance itself turns into dust or ash. And, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It's a very potent alchemical concept. So if you don't do this and you feel that there's something missing in your life, it's all in your head, and it, which it is, of course, you know, try to, to do a little ritual with burning a candle, burning some incense. Make something of nothing. Give a little magic to these mundane, busy lives that we lead. All righty. Oh, I did find one question that I'm going to answer. <laughs> because some of these questions, people, quite frankly, um, you know, uh, they're silly. So don't ask silly questions. This is about spirituality and metaphysics. Um, you know, where have all the good men gone? I couldn't tell you. Yeah, I'm not even interested. So, all right. So, this question is from Peter Q. Um, oh, and he's just down the road from me in, um, in Salem, Oregon. Okay. And Peter Q says, what if we can't afford to have you come down and spiritually clear our space? Surely there must be something that we can do that will have uh, a positive effect. Well, there is. There is. Um, I've got lots of quickie methods for clearing space. So this is the simplest one that there is. And it's a very ancient practice. And these are all golden light practices. Ancient, ancient shaman work, simple and potent. All divine light is golden light, the highest vibration there is. So if you want to clear a space for whatever reason, whether you think you have a ghost and you want it to be moved on, or you've had an argument with someone, you just want to restore the space to divine alignment. Go stand upon the space. Take nine deep, slow, purposeful breaths and relax your shoulders while you do the breathing and use your diaphragm to breathe. There's magic in that. Inhale slowly and purposefully and then exhale fully. This is important. When you exhale fully, the next breath that you inhale saturates your body with cosmic intelligence. And it's just a beautiful practice. It, it's a bit like getting stoned without getting stoned, without getting the side effects. So take your nine deep, slow, purposeful breaths and feel your aura expanding just expanding. It doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to encompass the entire space. 
but just feel that alignment with cosmos through your breath. And then for nine more breaths, imagine a beautiful golden rain falling on the property you're trying to cleanse, saturating it with beautiful golden rain, refreshing, lovely. And then for nine further breaths, imagine a beautiful golden wind, a breeze coming through and refreshing the entire area. So the rain stops and now for nine breaths we bring in that beautiful golden breeze round and round and round picking up all redundant energies anything that doesn't serve anything that has no value up it goes in the breeze up into the ether and then for nine further breaths imagine the golden light pouring onto the property Beautiful, beautiful golden light, streams of it, as if the sun was just throwing rays at you, just saturating and down into the ground as well. For nine more breaths, beautiful golden light. So you have cleansed with the rain and you have also refreshed with the golden breeze. And then with the golden light, you have vitalized and you have stabilized. And when you're done, give thanks and move on. You know, this type of visualization is, uh, is very important. We don't practice enough visualization. We sort of say a prayer and hope that it's heard, or we throw out an intention and we hope that it's heard. Well, here's a little bit of news that may be news to some of you, and some of you may already know this. But intention is everything, and faith is a nebulous concept, and direct knowing is where we want to be. So if you don't really believe that you're going to be heard by God or Creator or Cosmos, whatever, you won't, because nobody up there or around you has any obligation to come down and feel sorry for you, because they only see us as they created us. Pure, unblemished, cosmic divine potential, Having a temporary individualized manifestation as a human, they can see our humanity, they can see all the troubles that we have, but they don't take those seriously because the only part of us that's real is divine, 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 cosmic, cosmic, cosmic. And that's something to remember always. The whole point of a physical incarnation, in my humble opinion, is to let the spirit inhabit the human. So many times we're told, oh, you know, all that God stuff, isn't that fabulous? All that church stuff, isn't that fabulous? But, you know, it doesn't really apply to everyday life. And whatever you want to call the establishment and in all its many forms, they'll do anything they can to keep you non-aligned with your true nature. And if you look at the world around you today, you'll see proof of that all over the place. You know, people tell me a lot, you know, Arnie, you're a shaman, why you talk about politics, blah, blah. Well, heavens above people, let the spirit inhabit the human. If we don't take a good, long, hard look at the world we have co-created through our lack of spiritual alignment, how are we going to fix it? We're going to, what are you waiting for aliens to come and fix it? Some people are. It's going to be a very long wait. I mean, they're here, but they're not going to fix it. That's our karmic obligation, not theirs. So it's all very well to sit in the room and meditate and get into groups and meditate. And actually, it's essential. I meditate twice a day, every day. We should all meditate. But meditation alone isn't going to fix it. Though some might disagree with me, because clearly thus far, it has not worked. So meditation, along with taking our intention into the real world, that's where it's at. You know, when you meditate, it's not just communicating with the divine. It's literally going back and finding the pure, pure perfection of your pre-embodied state. It's almost as if you leave your body and you go to where you need to be and touch source energy and refreshed, come back into body 
and let every single cell of your body know where you've just been. And the DNA RNA codes are going, woo, optimal physical health template. Let's restore to that. Woo, optimal spiritual health template. Let's restore to that. That, in my mind, is what meditation is all about. Bringing your true nature into whatever is your current realm of experiencing. Then you get up from your meditation, give thanks, and get out there and do all the mundane stuff that we do. But it's not mundane anymore, is it, when you've done that? It's actually magic, because you are now magic. Because what is magic? Magic is alignment. When you're in alignment with the cosmic forces, the hierarchy of life, ah, everything is serendipitous and there's synchronicity and, well, lots of other S words. It's fabulous. You don't have to even work very hard. A functional life, a harmonious life, a world where we can all live together in peace is the side effect of daily meditation and prayerful contemplation. Contemplating, what is unconditional love? Contemplating your true nature. You have all these problems, we all have problems. We, what do we do? We sit down and we dwell on our problems. When you're overwhelmed, put your problems aside because worrying isn't gonna do anything about it, right? When you're overwhelmed, light a white candle, make yourself a lovely cup of tea, Sit down and contemplate something along the lines of, I am source energy. I was there before the Big Bang. I experienced the Big Bang, and maybe there were the string theory things as well, but I've been everywhere at all times. I've experienced everything there is to experience because I'm connected to this ever eternal matrix of creation. Think about how absolutely magnificent you are. Multiple incarnations, past, present, future, all happening simultaneously, yet you're completely focused on your life in this one personality, on this one planet, listening to this one podcast. That's magnificent amount of focus, my darlings, we have. All we need to do is to tweak that just a little bit and remember that we're not humans we're source energy we're cosmic space adventurers our humanity is just one adventure we're having it's one book we've written in the entire akashic library of our experience and at all times we are connected to the matrix of life there is no such thing as being off the matrix. There is no such thing as having your light turned off. It's just a question of whether we choose to be dim or we choose to be fully lit. And if we're dim, well, we're a bit of a weak link in the chain, aren't we? So I urge you all, you know, don't dwell on the minutiae. Dwell on the big picture stuff. Spend 12 minutes a day minimum just deep breathing because it's fantastic and you won't know how fantastic it is until you've done it for say 30 days in a row and then from time to time take time out to contemplate your true nature because we are gods in bods we really have to start embracing the marvelous reality that we all came from Life changes when our vantage point changes. It truly becomes magical. And we'll go from tragic, as they say, to magic. And that would be quite wonderful, wouldn't it, really? And we all owe it to each other to help ourselves out, you know, and to help each other out just a little bit. You know, when, when we see people, our friends, who are sad, they're depressed, they're locked in debt, everyone's locked in debt, you know, um, indentured servitude, debt is the new, the new slave chains for this era, really, isn't it? You know, how do we help each other when we're all depressed all the time? We've been trained that when someone is depressed and they're down, or they're going through a trauma, they're going through a hard time, that we're supposed to go down to their level. Like, you know, if one of your friends is broke, you dare not talk about your new dress. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, um, if someone's really depressed, you dare not be happy around them. You're supposed to sit with them and be depressed. You know, that's rubbish. If somebody is giving off a vibration that is less than whew, harmonious and functional and vital and vibrant, and you match that vibration, you've strengthened that vibration. You can have empathy and not, you know, you don't have to be sympathetic. You can just have empathy and say, hey, I understand what you're going through. I've been through it too. But don't let your vibration go down to theirs. We see this in funerals all the time. People are just, they're sad, of course. They've lost somebody that they love. And that's always going to happen, even if you understand eternal life and, and the laws of the cosmos. But I think that there's just far too much wailing and gnashing of teeth where we're all supposed to be uplifting each other. Accept. You're sad. Yes, I'm sad. We're having a bad day. You're having a bad day. I accept it. But let's not stay there. Once you accept something, anyway, something shifts around that, doesn't it? You know, when you accept something, it doesn't mean you like it. Like if your house is on fire, you're not going to go, oh, I accept my house is on fire. How wonderful. No, your house is on fire. You accept that your house is on fire. And it cuts the resistance to it somehow. You've accepted that something is the way that it is. And that cools your vibration. It cools your anxiety. And in that coolness, in that stillness, the solution, the answer, the way forward, that comes to us. So, you know, there I am again, digressing. I was supposed to go back to Q&A. But I think it's important that we that we look at the things that are in our face every day. If we're prone to depression, you know, let's sort that out. If we have certain habits that we find dysfunctional, uh, you know, distracting, let's sort that out. Everyone's in a funk. Everyone's arguing. Um, and i just be honest, I don't think most of us know what we're arguing about. We're just repeating things that other people have said. Let's start a people's revolution. Let's start an intellectual revolution. Let's start a heart chakra revolution. Let's reclaim our minds from the relentless campaign of indoctrination and perceptual engineering and just sit quietly each and every day and think, who am I? What am I? What am I doing here? And allow spirit to answer those questions for you. Just allow yourself to be comfortable with the silence because in the silence is where you discover your magnificence. And I really, really want us all to become familiar with our magnificence. And I want our true nature and the knowledge of our true nature to be the primary vibration in our auras, in our energy fields at all times. Because that's when the magic begins. Well, my darlings, I, I think we did it. Um, we wasted an hour. So there we go. Looks like we've come to the end of the show or close to. I do hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you'll tune in again for the next one, which I believe is July 24th. But uh, if you don't, if you can't, uh, it'll be on Cosmic Reality Radio's YouTube channel uh, and then probably in their archives. So, hey, I'm Arnie Avedisian, and you've been listening to Metaphysical Martini, a production of Cosmic Reality Radio. Until we meet again, let the spirit inhabit the human. You have been listening to The Metaphysical Martini Show with Ani Abedisian, the suburban shaman, a production of Cosmic Reality Radio.